popular matchup so far. Is there any room at all to kind of make that better, like to get better when she gets tankier, when she gets items? But does Tonal just continue to outscale as the game drags on? Or does Poppy sort of hit a point where she's okay? Well, in, in the 1v1, I think it just gets worse and worse, pretty much, because yeah. you're stealing more and more stats. So I think there's never actually a time where it's like, ooh, Poppy hit her two item power spike, now she kills Trundle. But that's not the reason you pick Poppy. Yeah. It, Similar to the Jace matchup and whatever, you can kind of just get pushed in as long as she's be staying relevant, getting XP, getting farm. Uh, not even doesn't even have to be close really to Trundle and farm. You can be behind. You have big team fight impact. Yeah, it's like Poppy can always knock Trundle out of the team fight. So in theory, at every stage of the uh, team fight, when Poppy can alt somebody out, she'll be worth more than the, the her counterpart, I guess. Even if the lane one v one's not great. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like. Great, you have 50 CS up on the Poppy. Well, she just stunned your Ash into the wall and now your Ash is dead, 100 is zero. So now that advantage does no longer matter, right? It's, it's that kind of impact that you're looking for when you do play with a Poppy. Uh, there's not really a lot of kind of like big play potential right now with Poppy's W in this game. There's not like dashes for her to interrupt or anything, um, but there are people who are pretty susceptible to getting caught out by a Poppy flanked. Like the Ash and the Zyra are both uh, two pretty good ones. If you can pin either of those guys, they're gonna be in a lot of trouble. Well, we have moved ourselves on a Summoner's Rift to start with game one here in our player experience stream best of five just a reminder though you can join the conversation on twitter use the hashtag ask the casters and we'll feature some viewer questions during the game so if you have questions for about the game to us or maybe to zig down here as well for our special guest uh bring those coming we'll add to them as the series continues i would recommend ask zig definitely last week she's gonna be making stuff up you know <laughs> but uh i i trundle also trundle is actually something i've played quite a lot of over the over the years um and when i look down the line this is actually not a team that seems very fun to play Trundle into. Uh, because although Trundle is going to be great in the 1v1, if you look at actually uh, team fight type stuff, uh, you have Karma, Q Slow, you have Slow and good kiting ability like from Caitlyn. Uh, when Rylize is out there on the Victor, that's going to be even more slows. You have Tether from Karma, there's Cocoons, etc. There's a lot of stuff to kind of like keep you from actually getting onto your targets. I feel like a lot of these people are pretty evasive and can kite the Trundle pretty well. Yes, uh, Trundle does have kind of a dive buddy with the Olaf and the Pillar to get in there. Uh, but I don't think that this is one of those games where it's super easy for Trundle to run wild in the back line. I, I don't know how you feel about that, Sig. Yeah, I think Trundle just, in, in this comp, it's just like they can kind of teamfight. Like, his Pillar is really good, but that's the most, like, the biggest part of his utility, and he just presses R on Poppy. But yep. they probably will, like, I think their 4 is pretty strong still, so exactly. hopefully, like, I think the best way to use Trundle in this game is just send him versus the Poppy and just push try forever. to yeah, carve out a, a split push lead. And... Yeah, and, and it can certainly get to that point in the matchup where if Trundle gets enough ahead, you can just actually ignore the Poppy's damage and just hit the turret. Uh, which kind of becomes a pretty depressing part of the game for the Poppy. Yeah. A and then it becomes a, a race for the Poppy not actually to hit the Trundle, but to clear the wave so that the turret hits the Trundle and makes him back away. Well, just a quick note as well. Apologies, though. We did seem to have an audio issue to start the game intro, but we are all good now as well now that we've gotten the game. So apologies for that, guys, but should be all good now. And that will continue with our analysis here of the 1v1 matchup. So just to kind of set things up again, Poppy Trundle should be interesting as far as the early lane goes. We can see that Duke does have a decent amount going on, but it seems like Smeb is keeping it relatively well. Looking for as it gets later, Duke should get an advantage. I think jungle pressure is probably the other thing as well. Peanut, we have seen, will go top lane a decent amount of the time. And if he can assist here, maybe he can get involved and try and snowball the matchup, but Bengi can do the same. And, and Bengi is, is at least going to be able to play some wards and stuff. And it's actually pretty interesting to track uh, jungle farm as well. And I'm not sure how it actually happened, but Bengi is quite ahead of Elise, and, and that alone is something that you want to be tracking as a top laner, uh, because if your jungler loses priority and stuff, the way that you play and the way that you have to play against your opponents uh, becomes very different. You mean, it's, it's 16 CS to 8 right now for Bengi, so Bengi you know, has the level of advantage, he can be more aggressive, and, and that's allowing him to get in there and, and kind of pressure his opponent, and, and the fact that Duke is pushing in Smeb means that he can move up and, and try to assist his jungler. I'm actually curious to know what route Peanut took, or I guess that's just Olaf full clearing versus Elise full clearing or something because he was like eight CS down. I mean, Elise should definitely not be that far behind. You can you can clear pretty quickly. I think it had to be something where a buff got stolen away or he tried to gank that fail um, because there's no way you'd be that far behind. I mean, he's quite a few camps down. I guess the CS is also a bit misleading because Raptors counts as four and Scuttle counts as one. Yeah. So it, yeah, XP could be pretty close, but yeah, it's it's not a super big deal now that Pina actually was able to ward him off the Gromp. If he lost Gromp there too, I think it gets a lot worse. Yeah. Uh, because that actually ended up wasting a lot of Bengi's time. You know, he has to go back, and and now Duke has to be a bit careful, knowing his jungler isn't around, and respecting the fact that the Elise was topside, got that camp. It's something that you're always gonna have to be aware of. Yeah, kind of a soft exchange in the jungle. We did see Duke come down, 
as I was pushing lane to Smeb, but Smeb has kind of reversed it now. And this is very common in 1v1 uh, top lane, particularly because it's so long. You see a lot of wave manipulation in general, but it's probably something to get a bit more into, especially as we will see a lot of this for these players. And, and to me, this is just a nod to the fact that they kind of lost control of that top side of the jungle. As Duke, you want to play it safe because you don't know where Elise is right now. So even though you could pull it, push this guy in and bully him out, you have to respect the fact that Elise could be there. Uh, so he's just going to let the wave come back to him and he'll collect the farm. So the Poppy's only down like four, five CS total, six mm -hmm. CS. Yeah, it's pretty bad. good in this early matchup. Yeah, like he had to pull the lane from level one. He couldn't walk up and get any of the melee creeps level one because Tron will just give you a big chunk of your HP if you try to contest that. And I think they're both playing the matchup pretty well. It gets way harder, I think, for the Poppy as, as time goes on, actually, though. Yeah, especially first buy, he could probably pick up a Tiamat or something. And, like, I don't know actually how if he's going to have... No, he probably won't have enough gold. I wonder what he's actually going to go for here. Uh, so he's he probably have, Tiamat. He yeah. has 1,300 gold right now, so... Tiamat pinks a good buy. Yeah. Well, we'll have, we do know that Smeb has already gone back. He didn't use his teleport, so we'll have that option and can maybe influence another lane with the TP. We see a lot of Poppy's sort of team fighting and skirmish ability come up, but this seems like really basic. Start corrupting potion, have some boots, and then Ruby Crystal Cloth Armor. Like, this is please don't let me fall behind in this lane versus that now completed team at plus the pink that you mentioned, Zig. Yeah, and I think it was it was a smart time for Smeb to buy. He couldn't really like hang around. He was out of mana and stuff. He pushed it up. He had to base there. Um, but he didn't get a great buy, like as you said. I mean, it, it's not like crazy not bad or anything. It's not amazing. But it, it's, it's certainly going to be more in the favor of the Trundle, who now has the completed TM ad. And, and he can just play this safe once again. Doesn't know where Elise is, so he's not going to look to actually bully. He's just going to be just kind of collecting the farm because it is one of those situations where, as Trundle, you're pretty happy you're just farming this out too because you are going to get stronger and stronger. Yeah. I think this game, he'll probably go for Ninja Tabby, like the Poppy. But. Yeah, I mean, I think it just gets harder because Poppy ulti is not really good in combat like in a 1v1, and Trundles is like the best ultimate, I guess, in a 1v1 that exists. I remember, like, Renekton used to be super meta. And They're actually threatening the dive here, though, which is which is pretty big because there's a huge wave stacked up, so if Duke gets dove here, this is really bad. It's level 6, though. So. I see an overstay. Oh, that miss is actually it. Peanut's going to go back in. Warbank doesn't quite land onto the stun, and Duke should be okay here. I mean, nice attempt from Mox. They don't overcommit, but actually, oh, they're three as well. Going for it again. Duke could be in trouble. Also, Duke could be Peanut going to chase him. There's the Q down. Going to keep running, and Duke, he's actually out scot free. That was really well played by Duke. The fact that he's able to actually absorb that much pressure, he actually got some of the farm in the midst of that, was trying to clear out the wave, but he played that very, very well. He has his TP, and the fact that Peanut was low, Curl already expended his ult, he's gonna have to go back. So he could just TP back to lane and collect most of his farm if he wants, but he's actually gonna play it even safer, just not chancing the fact that they could have waited around and, and looked to redive. Yeah, he played pretty slow. I think it was actually just wishful thinking, thinking they could kill the Trundle, because he just trundled. Like, he clicked R, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know that Victor was moving up, though. That was, like, the game changer, I guess, that yeah. meant he could have died. But they, like, missed every single skill shot. So. Oh, and now Peanut. Red Dog's going as well. CT going to keep chasing, but it's that Peanut's okay. Arrow will miss there from Bang. But you can see where Peanut's just been trying to apply that topside pressure. We had three people top. SKT smartly react down to the bottom side. I know it's a lot of focus, but you can see Kuro suffering a bit in CS for that roam as well, so. Yeah, and, and, and partly, you know, it's one of those things where because he was losing mid lane, he feels like he has to get something done elsewhere on the map, right? So that can force you to go other lanes. And and because uh, Duke was able to absorb that pressure and not die, that means that, you know, Faker can now get further ahead. He can get the advantages. And and, and you don't always have to be the guy to carry it. You can just absorb pressure. And, and honestly, not dying <laughs> is sometimes a huge win as a top laner because uh, you can get camped pretty hard. And had he died there, it would've been really bad. Yeah, I think Olaf also walked into Elise bot side jungle and like bot lane had to feel pressure too. So it was just absorbing three people and then not dying is like your entire team gets the bottom side of the map for free. So. Yeah. Well, Banky is actually just disgustingly ahead of Peanut right now. Faker is way up as well. Uh, so jungle mid are going to be so much stronger uh, that there's no reason for Duke to try to try anything too crazy. Like he can kind of just sit back and let those guys accrue advantages. I mean, they're a thousand gold up of just just a farm, like which is mm -hmm. pretty rare to see those kind of gold leads open up uh, at this level. And and it just kind of gets worse. I honestly feel like uh, for the Elise, if the Elise is this far behind, Olaf can really just not care about anything that she does. So he can kind of take over and. And as a result, we are just kind of seeing a very slow lane uh, where they're just going to kind of farm it out. You think he's going to cancel his back? Smep? Could pillar it. Oh, he's going to try and pillar it? Yeah. Very nice. There you go. 
does have a ward in there as well, so extra easy <laughs> to make sure he stops that down, but of course frustrating for Smeb, who's been doing just fine in the lane we talk about, you know, he has had some leads here and there, Duke's been playing very safe, did avoid the 3v1 tower dive, which was nice to see as well, and this is I think something nice at a high level for FK Telecom, they've got aggressive solo laners, who like to play 1v1, Faker and Duke are very good players playing against an opponent that can really outclass you, but I think Duke playing safer in a matchup he knows he's going to continue to win as the game goes later is actually just very smart play from SK Telecom overall. Yeah, and, and, and the fact is, even though Poppy's up 10 CS, it actually doesn't matter at all. Yeah, like, it's Poppy's you, you have to be so far ahead uh, to ever be able to be like, oh yeah, now I'm going to 1v1 the Trundle, right? Like, the Trundle could be down like 40 CS randomly and still 1v1 you because of the ultimate. So, uh, it's, it's something that is very good for Poppy, but he got a lot of help and it wasn't really worth uh, the detriments that it caused kind of around the map. Yeah, I think snowballing a poppy lane is like not really that useful unless they actually got the kill there. It, like that might have been worth it because then he would have missed like a huge wave of XP on top of that. But just the fact that he like survived and then got most of the XP as well and then drew three people, it's like, yeah, he, he's doing great in this matchup right now. Yeah. Duke solving the CS puzzle there, always nice to see. And again, just playing back towards the tower has had a defensive ping pull, but it was cleared out by Rox. You saw him place it in that little brush just there where the pings are going. So again, Duke, happy to play it safe. I mean, Smeb has his TP, they both save, so maybe he's looking to influence the side. And is that where Smeb is looking to maybe leverage yeah. an advantage? I, I think that Smeb would love to, to make a play, you know, on bot side and stuff. But the, the fact of the matter is, uh, Bang and Wolf have kept really good vision up in the lanes. They've not allowed TP wards to come in, so he's going mid lane. That's interesting. Oh. Very nice old flash from Faker. They both flashed the at least Poppy. Yeah, that was super uncoordinated. Uh, Peanut actually flashed in for the cocoon as Smeb flashed and knocked him out of the cocoon. And then Faker is able to get away from a 1v3. So Rox is honestly looking pretty shaky here as far as coordination wise. First, the top lane dive, as you said, they miss all their skill shots, but even they went in without Victor. And now they roam, they blow two flashes and don't even get anything done mid lane. So yeah, that also caught Duke back up a little. He got he got to push the wave in for free and got a good buy. So. And again, continuing to walk to lane also. Looks like he's going for Titanic Hydra. I mean, we maybe expected Duke to turn into a split pusher as the game goes later. We often see Ravenous, but is Titanic just fine here is my assumption. Like, I feel like there isn't too much difference as far as the itemization goes. I think it's good. He might feel like he's like a bit behind or something. Yeah. I'm not really... Because usually I think Ravenous is actually better in this matchup, but I think, yeah, the Poppy's like tanking up a little quicker. So maybe he doesn't want to get... Because, uh... yeah, like Poppy's bases are pretty high, so... Without the like without the Jarm's fist component, he might like take a bad trade and then be too low to like walk up and life steal it back. So yeah, it's just one, a safer bet, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. One one reason that I do sometimes uh, do this or, or see people do this is basically yeah, like I, I think Ravenous is just straight up better in the one v one. But because he has been getting a lot of attention top lane, Titanic does you make you that little bit more tanky. So especially if you're gonna get ganked or something, it gives you a better chance of kind of surviving dives and stuff. Having that extra HP early on, I think, is pretty nice. And they spent Asho and Poppy TP. Smeb came down actually. Yeah, look at oh, Faker tanky. again. All oh, slams him into the wall. Very nice. And there's first blood for Smeb. Wolf's not gonna get himself chased down, but Bengi's in the thick of it. Not really where he wants to be standing. Nice ult after the Ragnarok wears up. Should be another kill on Rock. That's the collapse they wanted. Third time's a charm. Yeah, <laughs> it works, it works out. Yeah. I mean, the bot lane wasn't there for SKT, so they're essentially fighting like a 3v5, right? And yeah. Duke wasn't able to enter the fight at all. Uh, that's that's kind of the impact of the poppy. Finally, Smeb does land that wall bang on Faker, and Faker goes down without being able to use any of his spells. His bot lane's not there in time. Duke can't join the fight, so uh, they do make it happen, and, and this was honestly a very good punish here uh, from Rox. Is that, is that Faker over aggressing? Because he kind of looked like he's like on the wrong side of the map. and They were actually oh, trying to set up for a, a, dive, yeah. for a dive. Yeah, Bengi, oh. Bengi was by the Wraith Rush. So they were trying to have the Ash Arrow hit mid, Bengi running from behind and basically get a free kill on mid lane. Uh, but when that missed, they saw that SKT's bot lane wasn't actually in position, so they could just punish that. And uh, just like that, two kills given, given over. But still, the farm lead for SKT actually keeps them very slightly ahead. Uh, their advantage is kind of gone. <laughs> yeah, it is really weird to look at. Yeah. Two kills to zero and they're still up. There's an Infernal over to Rox though, I believe. So do get a Drake out of the deal, which isn't too bad. So at least transitioning there. Kuro though, he's on Struggle Street. Smeb and Duke going to continue to duke it to duel it out here. The fact of the matter is though, he's actually going to be ahead in gold, I, I would imagine, over Faker now because he has the mm. kill and the assist. And, and if they did actually get the Infernal, which they did. So it's, they're certainly up in the game now, I would say, just based off of that. Um, you know, Duke still does have his TP, so that is something going for him. Um, but we'll see if he's actually going to be able to get too much done with that.
That was kind of the amusing thing, actually. Smab was walking down and then teleported to actually set up for that play. So very short range teleport, but really creative positioning wise to try and catch up Faker. And now he's going to try and contest for this buff. Not going to get it. Just going to chase down Bangi, but no help forthcoming. And Olaf's pretty safe with his ulti in the enemy jungle, particularly given the farm lead Bangi's got for himself. Faker, though, is going to take that first turret pretty much by himself. Yeah, that was actually fully by himself. So that just shows how badly he smashed Kuro in the mid lane. The fact that he's up 30 CS, he absorbed some ganks, and he took that mid lane turret. So they are now uh, back in that gold. The Titanic Hydra has been completed uh, for Duke, and, and this is going to be pretty scary time uh, for Poppy when he has like, a complete item. Ooh. There's Duke TPing. Yeah, looking for Gorilla, perhaps. Ulti's going to get flashed. Wolf's going to chase down. Nice flash pillar there as Gorilla's going to get chased down. Locked up there by Wolf and Gorilla. Nothing he can do. Duke actually gets in with the ulti pick. So, nice TP, just gets a trade kill. Not hugely impactful, but I mean, he knew Smeb didn't have his, so it might as well take the free kill. Yeah, exactly. It looks like he will actually uh, lose a lot of health on his turret here. He's, he's not going to lose it, uh, but that could matter later on. Still, I think it's, it is a good TP for them. Uh, they're going to have to be aware of the fact that Poppy is going to have his TP quite a bit earlier, and Smeb can look uh, to make some plays when that does come back up. Ooh, ooh. Oh, the wall, didn't find it. There's so many places you can stand. It's, oh my god, this is ridiculous. And you can just see how strong Duke is. That's without his ultimate. I mean, Smeb doing okay there in the tray, but Duke just feels so comfortable 1v1, it looks like. And if Smeb gets a tower, that's a great bit of pressure, but hasn't got it yet. And really all Smeb was trying to do there is actually just deny some of the farm to him. So he did actually make him miss a couple CS. So even though he was losing that trade, it wasn't about that. Uh, and I think that was worthwhile for Smeb to do just as, as a little thing. Well, they probably should have, it was, I, they only got the kill because the Asher landed, I yeah. guess. Like, the TP probably would have been not for much if, yeah, if, if the Karma got to flash a little earlier, but not bad still. No call worth, I imagine. <laughs> Duke at least happy to move down for the kill. Looks like Bengi was around top, but Peanut's actually going to sneak in here as well. Have seen Peanut up here a couple times, not really aggressively camping the lane perhaps, but at least showing some attention, although it looks like they know Duke is back, so they'll just back away from the place. Map actually just going to make sure he pushes the lane out safely now that he has the information that Bengi and Duke are now gone from the lane. Always important to push your minion waves in. That's what every player tells me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then that's something that I think a lot of players, especially in lower elos, don't understand. The I'm pointing to myself, but those of you that can't see. <laughs> and it, it's, it's something that's really funny because you could actually TP bot lane, get a kill, and be put yourself in a worse position, right? Like It's like, yeah, great, I killed them. But now your wave is frozen against you, or now you lost two or three minion waves. Like So so tracking your, your minions in top lane especially, I think is, is more important than really almost anything else. Um, Especially because, you, especially if you get behind an XP advantage, right? Like if someone gets a lot of levels on you, uh, they can freeze you out. It's a long lane and it can be really tough. Yeah, usually the rule of thumb is before you want to do something, you want to push your wave first. Like you want to make sure you have priority, to, which is like free time, I guess, to do something. Mm -hmm. And you only really achieve that when there's no creeps alive in your lane. Yeah, I think that's a great creeps. concept for a lot of people kind of new to the idea is that you really push the waves to give yourself space and time so you can try and do something else. If you don't do it, for sure, you push your wave in already, you can come back and just kind of reset the situation. I'd also... What if uh, they saw him? They, uh, he did they see did. him. He walked over a pink. And the turret's really low. I think they're actually just going for the turret. They're not trying to get a kill here, and they will be able to get that. Yeah, Duke's not going to make poison, so... Um, but just to talk about builds a little bit here, mm -hmm. I think it's actually super smart for Duke to just go straight into like a spirit visage right now, uh, and don't actually worry about building armor. Because if you look at Prey's build, like I don't know what's happening there, but he actually got a QSS before <laughs> even completing an item. Oh my so God. he has a BF and a QSS. There's like no physical damage on this team whatsoever. Pretty much if Trundle has early MR against the Victor and against the Elise, who's gonna kill him? Like you don't actually need armor at all yet. Uh, Prey is going to do nothing. Poppy does not really a lot of physical damage that you have to worry about. So to me, this is a, a pretty smart build. And I think that it could make him a teamfight menace. And I'm honestly pretty shocked to see Prey go QSS first item against, yeah. like, not that much DC. I guess he's just very worried about Ash arrows and arrow roots and stuff. But yeah, it's just it seems like a lane counterplay thing, yeah. I guess. It seems bizarre to me. I mean, the lane and bot has gone on for a while and Prey does have a CS lead. So maybe if that extends for longer, I can see it. But I think you're right. The cool thing to point out here is that with how Duke is built, he has this huge window for the next five, maybe 10 or more minutes that if he joins a fight, he can, assuming the game kind of stays at this point, he's going to be huge. And that's yeah. so hard for Rox to deal with, given that they're clearly investing into this Caitlyn to get somewhere in the mid to late game. And she's delayed now with the QSS fight. And, and it's something that he is kind of keeping in mind, right? And it's not just about what you're laning against, it's about what's going on in the game. 
right? So this situation is one where it makes a lot of sense for him to, to build some MR early. Um, he's going to be TPing bot lane as it looks like a fight's breaking out. Ooh, giving it a go. What happens? Slow that onto Gorilla. TP's already in. His T-Nut is going down, Duke. Just oh going to try and clean up and tank here. Ulti going to miss from Faker. Smeb does try and disengage him, but they will dive in under the turret. Flashes everywhere. Faker takes out Prey, and now Smeb's just caught oh, under the turret. SKP. Huge collapse. Kuro makes it late, but now Faker's going to try and kite him out. Is he going to go down? Smeb will get the kill there, and Bengi's going to go down as well. But Rock, they take their kills. They take the turret, and Kuro. He's trying to chase. Oh, he flashes in. That was manly. Doesn't get anything done, though. Big play from Kuro. Doesn't quite go where he wanted it to be. And they are done with the chase, finally. That was an interesting play there from Bailey. We finally see the top laners join some action. Yeah, and, and honestly, the start of it was really good for SKT. But then they, Faker, Faker and Duke should have just killed the turret, right? They, they didn't actually need to chase past it. Once they picked up that initial kill, uh, they kind of overcommitted chasing especially on the fact that it's a poppy, right? The poppy is actually pretty tanky there, and we'll see how this does uh, start out, but it looks like, wait, what? Whoa, Peanut just kind of repelled in a very bad way. Peanut has Playing not been the... having a good game. No. I mean, the top laners, I think both do a nice job cleaning the situation up. Yeah, and th this is actually like, so Ash Arrow missed, Figure misses his ult. They get a kill here, but this is now where you can just take the turret and you get out for free, right? So my mistake, it wasn't actually Duke chasing in, it was it was Faker and Bangi, but uh, Faker goes down, Bangi's gonna get taken out, and they do escape out at the end, but I think that was just kind of getting a little bit too excited, right? Like, much like Kuro at the end of that situation. Yeah. There's another fight over this Infernal. Smab looking for something. Does not quite have ultimate, I don't think. Gonna slam Bengi into the wall, though. Ragnarok pop. Pina gonna try and take the Drake, but Smab's taking too much damage. Ult there from Ash. Could be a kill over, and that's the shutdown for Bang Dragon. Gonna go over to Pina. Wow. Rock, do get it. Repel. What? Is no. getting into safety. Was that a plant that saved him? Nah, he went to the ward. Oh, that that's He was actually dead. Yeah, I don't know. Super dead. Why they placed the ward then? That's a yeah. That's a mistake that some players make too. Can't give Elise something to repel to. I actually think that was really kind of poorly played by SKT. They had such big advantage over the pit, and then they just let Peanut stay in the pit and finish off the dragon. They could have actually just gone into the pit and, and killed him off. Wolf. Um, yeah, Wolf does get taken out, but I mean, Faker still had his ult. You can control that space and and go and kill off kill off Peanut. Have your ball outside the pit. Walk through that, right? You'll just die. So I think that's actually pretty bad, and it's. It's very big for rocks because they're losing this and, and getting double infernal allows them to kind of stay alive. Well, the classic mid laners versus supports. Mid laners winning <laughs> in this exchange here and there. But we do actually have a Twitter question where I think there's a lot on the action. Nick Bay asks, so when do you buy Triforce as Poppy slash Trundle? And when is Iceborne Gauntlet the better pick besides the armor? So kind of the two different sheen items here, obviously a bit more aggressive. Yeah, I think I'm Poppy. There's never really a time you want to build Trinity Force. Yeah, unless you're like completely out of control. Yeah, and on Trundle, it's the same thing, actually. It's, yeah, if you're like really, really fed, then you can get a Trinity. But I think Iceborne Gauntlet is generally the better pickup. Yeah, the, w the one thing I would say, like, Trundle, I have seen it and I've, I've done it very occasionally. And I think if you are smashing, then it can be really nice in, in split push. If you're going to hardcore split push, you crush turrets with, yeah. with Triforce. So that is something that can be nice. And, um, as we're gonna see Kuro get away here, but but one build that I, I used to do sometimes back in the day, which was kind of really nice against against tanks, is you can it, it's very very like kind of one v one centric, but people would even go like Bork Triforce and things like oh, that, and you yeah, can yeah. you can it's almost impossible to lose to a tank with Bork Triforce yeah. as far as the one v one, but you are very squishy in in team fight. So so it's like if you're gonna do that build, you have to be sure that you can stay in a one v one and inside lanes, right? So so that's what I would say is if you're gonna be joining team fights, you need the tankiness. Uh, and, and probably don't go it. Yeah, Trinity. I think Trinity is actually just way better than split push item. Like you yeah. see, Fiora's go it over Black Cleaver sometimes, yep. but the attack speed too now is yeah. actually really nice. It's like yeah, Fiora's just a split pusher. Like yeah, people are choosing that over uh, Iceborne a lot on Ezreal, I think, in solo queue. Yep. And yeah, it's just all like the trade off between would you rather have armor or no armor. Yeah, and specifically in this situation, we can see Iceborne coming up for Duke, which is pretty standard for Trundle. Poppy, of course, going full tank. Dead Man's Plate, Sunfire Cape, and I don't think we'll see an aggressive item. Even something like Iceborne, which is kind of a bruisery item, I don't even think Smeb's going to do that this time around. Yeah, I, I don't think so, especially because he's, he's going to desperately need MR. Um, and I, I think this is actually a pretty tough game uh, to be playing a tank in, because it's one of those things where there's not like a great 
one-dimensional kind of uh, resistance that you can build. So he's building armor because he needs to be able to survive against Duke, and he knows Ash is going to be a problem. But Baker's really big on Orianna, and Zyra also, I think, throws a wrench in the gears because Zyra is not an insignificant amount of extra magic damage coming in. You know, especially once this guy has Leandries and stuff, the amount of ambient damage you'll take from Zyra's plants and, and damage plus Faker is actually something you cannot ignore as the poppy. So uh, it becomes really tough. Sorry, that was a funny Wait moment. Wait the very end, yes. I do agree with you, but I mean, Smab obviously banning him there. But we do actually have another Twitter question. Slushy asks, as Poppy, would you rather ult someone out of the fight or use it to knock enemies up? So CCing in the fight or removing someone entirely? I, that's probably going to be context dependent. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very situational. Um, usually you only want to use the knock up one to reposition or to allow your teammates to catch up or to reposition to get a wall bang. But in a lot of late game team fights, ulting people away is like super, super valuable. Like especially if it's like you're setting up for an objective like Elder or Baron and um, you, you want to like zone the enemy jungler. If you just land the R spell on them, you can like punt them like 5,000 distance away or something. So. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree completely. I think that like a really good poppy ultimate uh, in a late game team fight can actually be as worth as much as just killing someone because you can have someone out of the fight long enough that the fight is already over, right? They have the most fat AD carry or Cassiopeia or whatever in the world. If you can knock those guys away and, and secure a fight before they can return, that could be super, super valuable. So I think especially later in the game, uh, as one team fight can decide it, I think kind of knocking people away can can be good. But yeah, besides position repositioning stuff, I don't really think Poppy Yeah, the other use good. case I think for Poppy is like you're walking up to a tower, getting ready to siege it, and your team Dumb like has off. Baron or something. Yeah, you just you spin the hammer and you don't even have to cast <laughs> it because it goes on a 30 second cooldown if you let it time out. And, that could be enough of like people, you know, not really wanting to step up to eat that, that spell. Good old Heli Poppy is getting on to fake. A great question there as well. Thank you, Slushy. And don't forget, guys, ask your questions out on Twitter using the hashtag AskTheCasters, and we'll be answering your questions throughout the game and, of course, this series as well. So make sure you keep those in. And great to hear you guys' insight on the matter. Are we setting our lane though? Duke's gonna go back. We do have Spirit Visage coming up for Smeb, so kind of the expected stuff here. Recall canceled. Smeb's gonna leave him alone this time. And the Icebone Gauntlet's done for Duke. So you can kind of see these guys setting up for where they want to be. Duke wants to be in the sidelines, does have some team fight presence, of course, and will be fine, but he's mainly just trying to create pressure. Smeb, building up towards those three big tank items, wants to be the big team fight presence. Yep. Yeah. So at this point, either of them can kind of like face check each other. They build enough tank items that it's like, there's no real Ooh. fear. Oh, good flash. Yeah, that was a really good early flash from Faker. He knew that Smeb was going to was gonna go for that wall bang, and he gave him enough respect to early flash it. Because if he's already flying in there and stuns you, obviously you're going to die before you get out. So uh, just showing some respect to Smeb there. Yeah, I think you can actually flash that spell pretty late, but it's always better later or earlier than never because yeah. it feels really bad to get punted in the wall and just yeah. die. And just flash out. Ooh, fight again. Gorilla caught out. Wolf. Locked him down, burns the ultimate to do so, but a crucial pick now that a third Infernal Drake's actually come up. Duke also applying that pressure. Smeb, I like it, trying to make a play that's kind of what he needs to do, looking to pick off Faker, but the more free time you give this Trundle, the bigger pain he's going to become. Yeah, and I think that this is a pretty crucial dragon. You're going to see both teams trying to go for it. If Roxxon get a, a three Infernal lead, that can give them a really big edge here. But for now, I mean, SKT is happy to just have their top laner up here. And, they might actually be going for Baron. I see some people around there. Oh, they are. Yeah, they're going to try to trade Baron for the third Infernal because they know that Peanut is going to want that. Uh, and this is going to be pretty big. Peanut is going to stay down there. So Baron's they'll be gone. contesting this that's too late. Hook shot. Everyone freaks out for a second. Peanut Frodo belts the dragon. And that's three Infernals for a Baron. But SKT, you have to think, especially given the current gold lead, that gives them the immediate advantage. Exactly. That's, that's what they're trying to go for here. They know that in the long run, this is actually going to be like a bad trade if it goes like 20 minutes longer. Uh, but right now, who the heck is going to stop Duke in a side lane with Baron buff minions? They're, they're basically saying that we will be able to amass such a big gold lead that we can close up. Yeah, they have a lot of hard engage too. So if they all like follow a Baron wave in, they can lead with Ash Arrow, Olaf just ghost and all and kind of scare people away. Yeah. So, and yeah, now the Victor 1E won't clear a full wave with yep. the Baron. So. And, and I think for, for Duke at this point, he just has to wait until multiple people come to answer him because Poppy cannot stop him at this point. So basically SKT just needs to stay as a four-man squad, not get caught, and just wait. This is because gross. sure, you can give up this outer turret, but they cannot give up a free inhib. So SKT is just hanging around, they're not pushing up, and this is something that they're they're working in conjunction to do this, right? If if the four-man squad just pushes up and gets five men engaged on and dies, then the split push doesn't work very well. But because they're working well with their team, someone will have to come and eventually deal with Duke. I mean, it feels like Duke right now, this is 
kind of easy mode as far as Trondle is concerned. He's got his items, he got the Baron buff, he's level 16, he's got free time in the lanes, and his team is looking very good in that four-man unit you mentioned before, Zig. So let's actually think about Cement for a second. We talked about wanting big team fight presence, wanting to pick people up. We've found a couple picks here and there, but like realistically, what can Smeb do? Maybe not as the Baron's going on, because SKT kind of have complete control, but what's Smeb looking to do to get himself into the game? Because Duke's role is fairly normal. Yeah, and that's always the answer, right, with top lane? Yeah, he just he needs a CP flank. I mean, they, they gotta wait the Baron up for sure, mm -hmm. just because there's not much breathing room for them and uh, with the Baron creeps and Victor not able to clear uh, stuff. And uh, yeah, it's just like he has to look for an uneven fight kind of while Duke is off doing his thing, beating his towers down. Yeah, wait, Duke actually feels invincible. Yep. Like eating think, cupcakes. <laughs> he moves them. He's like super tanky, but he also has like that really insane healing and. He also just demolished his tower. Yep, and this is this is where it, it's at that point that we talked about earlier, where oh, good. now it's it's just Poppy can't stop him, right? Like, and, and he is trying to scare him back, but now multiple people have shown here. So Karma shows SKT will push in on the other side, and it's the push and pull of the split push. And you can see SKT moving up in that side wave. Three people here. Now Duke's job is just to run. They know they can't kill him. Yeah. So they committed three people to mid lane. They're going to be losing their inhibitor turret, or at least taking damage on it right now. This is kind of the scary part, uh, and and this is the problem. Problem that, that happens when you can't answer in a 1v1. And there's Duke taking that turret. Just and look at bot lane now. So the, the wave is already stacked up there, so he can just go right down to bot lane if he wants. It's just a really worthwhile Baron play, though. They swept all the inners. That's like big gold swing. I don't know. Is, is there a stat? Can we get a stat? <laughs> With the Baron Power play, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe check that one out. We do have another Twitter question now. Uh, Duke's busy farming out some creeps. Michael Moore asks, what's the best target for Trundles R, the ultimate in a team fight? The kill target or the enemy tank always? Kind of where do you want to be using that impact ult, high impact ultimate that only works on one person? And yeah, now it's not Q accessible. Uh, it's a pretty easy choice most games. I think this game is pretty much always poppy. Mm -hmm. It's just the most value, like. Uh, okay. You want to burn the resist and you want to steal the resist, and there's no other person with too many resists. Um, and yeah. yeah, usually like it doesn't really shred that much if it's like a Karma or something. Like Karma gets caught out, you don't want to spend Rumble all on her, or sorry, turn all on her because she'll probably just die anyway. Like if she's an Asher or something. So yeah, I mean a, a really big part of it is not even just the healing the resistance that you're giving yourself, but it's shredding the enemy's tank yep. for your AD carry and for your for your mid laner and stuff, right? So that's really big. I will say that. There are sometimes opportunities to alt like a kill target, right? But it is rare. It's like one of those things, oh, well, he has, you know, 5% HP. I guess I'll ult him as he's running away, right? You can use it almost like an ignite to secure a kill sometimes. But I would say in, in 90 plus percent of the situations, you want to alt at the start of the fight on the poppy. So he's getting shredded. You're more tanky. And basically your front line wins out in that trade. So I would say as a general rule, it pretty much always wants to be on the tank unless, unless it's like 100% securing kill yep. that could not otherwise be taken. Yeah, with these team comps, it's like just a front to back type thing. And yep. It's like your front line's trying to roll off, enemy front line's poppy, and kind of Elise, but Elise just buys time with Lupel, and it's pretty, yeah, you, you should just solve the poppy. This right. looks miserable for Smith, by the way. I mean, Bengi's around, Peanut was there, but now Smith may be caught, doesn't quite carry Bengi to the walls. Of course, gonna lock him up, Strangle Thorns means he can't go anywhere, and that's an easy kill. Bengi actually gonna collect that one. That was kind of inevitable for poor Smith, it feels like. Yeah, I felt kind of like he could have tried more to get away, to be honest, because giving up his life there uh, means they're probably going to lose in Hib 100%. And he had Flash and Ultimate. He didn't even try. To me, that that, that was actually pretty surprising. Uh, I, I think if you early Flash and you try to ult, you have a chance to survive, and, and you got to take that chance, because they could lose they could lose a significant amount off this. Yeah, I guess he wanted to save it for... I guess it's all in on a, on a TP flank or yeah. something, right? Like, hoping that they can just win a big fight. Ooh, damage on the Bengi. Force the Ragnarok out. Did a good see, job holding. You can see Duke tanking a lot of damage, but still holding that ultimate. Did face tech the tower, but got it all back up with that trundle passive. And we talked about team fight ultimates for Duke before. It feels like he is really just committed to the split pushing. And why not? He has all that pressure. At this point, more than anything, is his ultimate just a tool to say, hey, this is how I never, ever die in a 1v... What, 1v3 at this point that we're <laughs> getting up to? Yeah, it's... The ult's just really, like, it's a, it's a, just a, I, I remember thinking of trying to, like, a better version of Renekton, because back when uh, Renekton was really meta, it was like, people were blind picking Renekton, and Renekton was great and everything, and then you realize Trundle actually does everything Renekton does, but kind of better, like, both of them hit six, one guy gets HP from his spell, but the other guy steals HP, and then steals resist too, so it's, 
And I think just the ult is like, it's good for split pushing, it's good for team fighting, it's just good for everything. It's like, it just makes you way more tanky and makes one guy less It solves tanky. all your problems. What a great ultimate. Yep. It's pretty much the best frontlining team fighting spell, I guess. Single spell, I think, in the game. Maybe, but Poppy ult's like really good too. Yeah. Though. I mean, but again, it's. There are some pretty high impact, like yeah, Mount Light ult and stuff. Yeah, that's you true. Know. Yeah, Rumble ult and Cannon ult. Cannon ult, oh, Mimu ult. There's like a lot I've of like, high I've never seen a good Cannon ult, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> oh, I think it's just one of the most frustrating, like, Non-descript type alts, like it's like it kind of like switches the power between two melee champions yeah. a lot, but it's just like it's some health getting sad from you or something. You don't really get to see much from it. I would also say I agree as far as consistency sake as well, right? Like Malphite alt might not hit anyone, but a Trundle alt is point and click. It's always gonna have good armor shred. It's super effective baseline, uh, which is very important. But it is worth mentioning um, the fact that Smeb, you know, so he didn't use his summoners, he didn't use his alt. But they didn't actually lose anything, so he had confidence in his team to be able to wave clear, and he was able to hold on to that. So it ended up being a totally fine uh, decision, since he, he didn't die. It doesn't actually, you know, they didn't lose anything, even though he died. It doesn't actually matter that he died. He didn't lose GA or anything like that. So ended up being totally fine. Turns out Smeb's better than me at top lane. He's a genius. He knew his team was there for him. Well, Gazeas get Talcom have accrued a huge lead and just took the Cloud Drake to trigger the spawn of the Elder Dragon on that next spawn. Baron is back up, which I think is part of the reason Smeb thought it was okay just to kind of sit there and not burn any yeah. resources because he knew that Baron wasn't available. I mean, Rox, they need to do something here, but SKT have started to group a little more. We have seen group with his team. That's aggressive. I actually think if they get this Baron, they're in a position to, to just win the game because they have they have triple Infernal. So this is a really big moment. And oh, Duke is in there, getting but it. it's already gone. It is actually gone over. Duke can get locked up. Bangy in the back line looking for it. Faker doesn't burn the ultimate, going to save it. That's our ulti, though. Going to make sure the Trundle's out. Nice zoning from Kura as well. Well played, Rox. Yeah, Rox, Rox has, they got themselves in such a big deficit, but because they have the triple Infernal, the longer the game goes, the better it gets for them. And the fact that they just took that Baron means SKT couldn't close out the game on the next Baron. SKT was pretty much counting on winning the game with, with this Baron here, where they grab this, they push it out, they're up like 12k after that Baron, etc. Instead, they're now up 8,000. Yes, that's a big gold lead, but their opponent has the Baron buff, their opponent has triple Infernal. And I think this is getting to the point where uh, that earlier trade is not worth it anymore for SKT, where where that triple and fertile starts to really uh, matter a lot. I mean, these guys are starting to get some big items, and this is you know four item Victor. He just has one more to pick up, and and he's gonna have 24% more AP. The Caitlyn and the Victor are gonna be absolutely terrifying. Now for me. Cool to see Rox maybe get themselves back into a game, but of course, looking at top lane, we've talked a lot about what Smeb can do and how high impact the Poppy can be. But he's just a big tank, he's gonna frontline. Good CC there with the E and the ultimate. What does Duke do here? Does he keep split pushing? Is there a worry that maybe he falls off here? Because I kind of look at how tanky he is, but he's just not as impactful as the Poppy. That's kind of the, the crux of the matchup that we've seen. Yeah, I don't, I don't think he falls off in the 1v1, yeah. okay. per se, but it's like, it just feels harder and harder, I think, as the game goes on, because Poppy all can be a lot more high impact than Trundle Pillar and everything, and it really depends on how team fights play out. Like, he tanked up enough with it so he can like be a frontliner and he can use his Pillar as a frontline as well, like, or, like create a lot of zone control, but... It's like he only kind of tickles carries and stuff. Like he's not, he's, he's not like a huge damage there or anything like that. Yeah. Especially because Karma is gonna be shielding whoever he goes on and stuff. Like you're not actually gonna be able to do enough damage to kill anyone solo. Uh, so I think as far as team fights, Duke is gonna really struggle. Especially because Triple Infernal, these carries are picking up a lot of items. You know, they have the Mortal Reminder, so his healing is being reduced too. Uh, Caitlyn is gonna be able to get to the point where she can kill this guy, and and I think that Duke needs to be in the side lanes because of that. That's that's where his advantage really is. Um, and, and he's going to struggle to be as useful in the actual team fights. Bang, actually looking for something on a snap. Arrow does oh, hit, but he kicks one out. No, it missed. That's, that's a disaster. Bang taking damage, but firing back in on the Smeb. Smeb, he's going to flash out. Hulk shot is good, but Smeb plays that very tricky. He gets himself out. I think the ult yeah, because of the pillar or something. I'm not really oh, sure. No. We'll have to see a replay, but I'm pretty sure he pillared at the same time the ult came through. and. And meanwhile, in mid lane, Rock Tigers are going to try and bust down and take out this inhib. And this is what FKT could not do with their Baron. We'll see if Rocks can do it, but looks like they are going to have to back off here. Feels like this whole game has just been watching Bang miss arrows. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually like the whole. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just feel like you have like a whole 10 hour montage of just missed Bang arrows from this game. That should have been our stream focus. Yeah, just Bang's arrows. Let's have a nice focus stream. <laughs> oh uh, it's been, been a little bit hard to to see all these missed opportunities that they've had because of that, because that should have been a kill. That said, I still think even with the missed arrow, they probably could have followed with Flash and killed Poppy. Uh, Poppy was at like 10% health. I'm surprised they didn't try to commit to that.
because they're losing a lot now. I mean, Rox is closing the, the gold gap massively. I wouldn't be surprised to see Kaylin, you know, finish her rapid fire and stuff. And we'll have this one more time. I think he might have charged out of it. No, it's just straight up miss. Yeah, he just he, shot it too low. It was before, before the pillar. Well. And, and look at this. Look how close he is and look how low he is. I, I feel like you can flash and follow that. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but the guy doesn't have a Ooh, hit. hello. Yeah, I think Ash could have fallen for sure. Yeah, I think Ash could have flashed in there. I think she, she actually probably thought she had to kill or something. Like, I don't know. Yeah, so pretty big mistakes, though, honestly, at that point, because when you commit multiple people, it's like the reverse situation of what was happening with the Trundle, right? Poppy now gets two people top lane. They don't kill Poppy, so on the side, they kill off multiple turrets. They kill the, the inner tier two for mid, the tier two in bot, uh, and Rox has picked up a lot of this gold, and then they're doing quite well for themselves, and uh, SKT has not done a good job of actually finding advantages with their lead, and, and obviously credit has to be given to Rox as well for avoiding the fights and avoiding that, but I, I do think that uh, SKT has not done the best job with, it, with their lead of actually trying to extend it. The gold lead feels like it matters less and less now. Oh, yeah. I don't think it matters hardly at all. With Triple Infernal, yeah. I actually think that Rox is ahead as far as stats. Yeah, that's true, actually. And Poppy just knocking one dude out. Yep. Really and that, that's sort of the cool place we've got here. Although oh, Smeb could be in trouble. Looking for a pick. Long flank. I mean, this is like a while to kill him, it's but if they can flash. kill him, it's very valuable. Gonna try and lock oh, him down. Yeah, okay. they give it up pretty much immediately. Yeah, SKT's threatening mid. So they can't really commit too long because it'll probably take a year and a half to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> it's just not worth it. Kind of a cool example of what, you know, Trundle can do with a lot of that pressure, given how unkillable he is in a lot of situations. FKT trying to get something back here, but the Elder Dragon's back up, and that's sort of the cool point. Uh, kind of don't look at the gold lead right now. As you said, Rox does feel ahead statistically as far gold as... Gold lead's fraudulent, pastry. It is. It is right now, and that means we have a very close game on our hands. There's big objectives coming up. The Elder Dragon and the Baron are going to matter. Ulti's going to miss Kuro, though. SKT needs to run pick. now because they don't have the Orianna ultimate. They got the flash, that's great. Here comes Mev. Oh, right now it's really bad. He got two there. Now there's a teleport coming in, but Kuro already took one down. He's burnt the ulti and slowing down Bengi, who does have the ultimate but isn't going to burn it just yet. He pops the ghost instead, and Duke TP's down to try and bust this top lane. That's really well done by SKT. So they, they were able to disengage. They know that although they just force something out, they use their cooldowns to do it. So combat power was lower. They get turrets on top and bot. Uh, but Duke needs to stay alive because it's actually so important that SKT takes the Infernal. If they don't get the Infernal, not only does Rox get a massive true damage burn, they get 50% more on top of Triple Infernal. So these guys would be at almost like 40% more APAD <laughs> with full builds and true damage burn. So SKT must contest this. They must take it away, even though it doesn't give them that much. All right, well, we've got a pretty important moment coming up. So I'm going to pop quiz you guys really quickly. We have a Twitter question. Fresh Damron asks, how much gold would you say Infernal is worth right now? So the triple Infernals the Rox has, we know that there's a gold lead attached invisibly to all these stats they're getting. Full pocket for me. Do some math on it. What's well, 24%? Oh, no, you're actually going to do math. <laughs> yeah, it's 24%. It's I think it's hard to do like actual, like straight up math on uh -huh. it. I think I think a that lot. it's... There's it's, only three people that are APAD users kind of, right? And then, yeah, it's, it's basically the Elise, uh, the Victor, and the Caitlyn. Mostly the Victor and the Caitlyn. Uh, but I would say it's, it's worth like a couple thousand oh, gold on, on both Victor. And oh, good kick out. Can they get the Dragon? Pay not going to go in for it. Looks for it. Does not get it. SK Telecom get the Inferno, but Rox oh, maybe want to find Faker. Oh. Huge ultimate. Melts two down as Gorilla is going to die as well. And Prey is going to try and shoot where he can, but Bang is going off. And Smeb is going to get just one. out. That's yeah, it. That's could be game. game here. I mean, Smeb and Bengi will do battle, but that's four clean kills for SKT. All they have to do is, is basically stop him from, from basing. The rest of the team is just going to push down, and uh, that that's probably going to be it. I mean, Smeb is doing his best here, but I don't think it really matters. The, the rest timers are just going to be so long. What if they got that Elder, though? Oh, yeah, my God. If they got the Elder, it's a completely different game. But, I mean, with that true damage burn, Baker, Baker got the kill because of the true damage burn. He basically insta-killed two people with his ultimate. It was so big, and that's going to be game one to SKT. Really nicely played okay. there. Very tense there, coming down to pretty much that last smite on the Elder Dragon. But that's sort of what we expected. SKT hold strong. And Demon should take 10 game one, but not the cleanest of games from either side. Very back and forth. It was kind of cool to see how the top lane matchup influenced the craziness that was sort of happening below it on the map. Yeah, I honestly don't think it was that much of like a bad game or anything. It was no, just it was that it was cool like as far as as far as like not clean. It was more it felt kind of like 
the other team was always making the correct decisions and stuff. So SKT's kind of gambit, okay, we'll trade Baron, we'll get really high head and gold, versus most teams that could have just closed out, but Rox didn't give them that opportunity, and Rox was able to kind of extend their lead through getting the Infernals, and they were always kind of trading back and forth. I think I think it was actually a very, very, very high-level game. Uh, pretty impressive, but... I mean, we talked about how, how late game team fights, how they matter so much, and yeah. all this stuff happens. Rox actually had kind of an advantage before that Infernal, I think, at, as far as like stats and gold and whatever. But the fact that A, comes down to the smite, that completely changes the fight. I think if the smite goes the other way, 